of you just joining us, I am talking world building with two experts, with Travis Van Graaff and Lou Anders, uh, and they have sent us their tips for approaching world building for new DMs, aspiring DMs, DMs who just want to up their game, and all of us who want to know what makes these experiences tick. Uh, and our next one, Lou, you had said, you suggested, think about place like character. What does the place want? What is the place best at? What's its problem? And then you said, very landmines waiting to be stepped on, which I find is sort of an amazing analogy. What does that mean for you? So it, it you know, as interesting as maps are, maps are not stories. Maps are backdrops. Stories are, the basis of story is someone wants something and cannot have it. Someone wants something badly and they are prevented from attaining what they want and their desperation, their need and their drive is what makes us care about character. And role playing games are very different from other forms of storytelling in that you don't know who the character is going in. You don't, you know, you, 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 in, 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 in novel writing, you would say that, that, that you can't just have a, your story is no good if anyone can be dropped into the lead role. There has to be a reason that the specific person, how to train your dragon, pick up is the only person who can make peace with dragons. No one else in that world would ever think to do it. And it, it, at, at the same time, the, the, the distance from where you are and where you want to be is what creates empathy. So leaving out certain authors' unfortunate statements in the press recently and not getting into politics, the reason we like Harry Potter is because he wants a family. And she could have just put him like everyone else had done up until that point in an orphanage. That would have been fine. You know, we go all the way back to Charles Dickens, we put the orphan in an orphanage. But she didn't put him in an orphanage. She put him under the stairs in the worst family in Britain. So not only is he uh, denied what he wants, he's up against it, like a puppy dog outside the glass looking through at the family that doesn't want him to have a part of it. He's so close and so far away. And that's why that character became such an immediate, you know, resonated so and grabbed everyone's hearts. And when you're in a role playing game, you don't have that. You don't have it because you don't know the characters that are coming to the table. So take the place and figure out what the place does really well. Who's against the place? What does the place want? What are the place's goals and drives? And then put it next to another place that's diametrically opposed to that. And then Bury landmines. So this person is on the verge of taking over. This person is on the verge of assassinating that person. This person has been thinking about stealing something but doesn't have the emphasis yet. So that every time they walk through a door, it can trip off something and it can set an event in motion. So it's great if there's a waterfall and there's a, there's a mystical creature that lives in the waterfall. That's wonderful. That's not a story yet unless the mystical creature knows a secret that the king of the realm is desperate to uncover. And now mm -hmm. it's a story. Now there's a place for the characters to insert themselves. Travis, how do you use setting? And do, do, do you find that the idea of the setting wanting things is a helpful way to look at uh, storytelling? Uh, it's, it's difficult uh, for me to say that exactly because a lot of my setting based stuff is still like they've just been in the woods. But uh, <laughs> uh, as far as the, the stuff that we've done with the woods, uh, making it interesting, uh, making it very alive and um, hungry. Your woods have character. Um, they do. Yeah, uh, I, I would agree with that. And having plot hooks that could go somewhere or could go off in a different direction. They find the ruins of a house. It's kind of scary if they decide to go in. We could go on a real adventure and find out um, more about what happened in this this village that's just been burnt to a, a crisp. But uh, the characters decided to skip that. So five pages of lost information later, you know, they're they're now back on their main quest. But we can we can always have these plot hooks, and I think they're it's always important to uh, think of at least a piece of an idea that you could develop into something bigger, even if you don't fully develop the idea, because uh, sometimes DMing is on the fly. But if you have a solution for if they go south instead of north, okay. We've got something that maybe can push them back north. Maybe there's there's dragons in the south, you know, with, with lots of fire, and we need to go back north because, uh, whatever it you might be. You just have to watch out 
that your dra- your players aren't like dragons? Yes, let's do it. And then you're doing a dragon campaign. Uh, speaking of which, your next tip was collaboration uh, with players or through research and feedback. Can you? What does that mean to you? How do you collaborate with with research? And how do you account for these player interactions when you're trying to build from scratch? Uh, for player interactions building from scratch, uh, the best example we have a character in our podcast named Soren. His background is a blank. And when they meet the first bad guy, the bad guy says, my liege. And everyone kind of looks at him funny. And he looks at himself kind of funny. And he has these moments where he doesn't really know where he wants to take his character. All of them are true until he makes a decision. And that not knowing which is true and he has nightmares and the nightmares could be flashbacks of his past. They could be him being a, a terrible murderer or they could just be nightmares of, of what he thinks might be in his past because he's got a bit of a, a problem where he can't remember most of his life, his adult life. So uh, giving players agency to push the story in a direction to have agency over their own backstories, which usually is the case, um, but maybe even more so. Maybe um, we, we finished a campaign and two people survived and the two who survived they asked if they could continue because in the backstory, one of them had had a wife and, and kid he wanted to get back to. And I said, you know, let's do that. Let's explore this, this strange uh, side of what could be and, and we'll pull in other players and we'll make that our, our next adventure. So um, the idea of maybe not all of the best ideas will come from you as you, you develop things and, and maybe the NPCs, the characters that your players love the most aren't the ones you thought they would and, and mm-hmm. really embracing those ones and doubling down, saying, "Okay, if you like this character, let's let's make them the focus. Let's make their little plight, which is just going to be inconvenience now, suddenly our our villain from the the castle fight, you know, actually killed their family or uh, stole their childhood doll and and hit them with it and and ripped off a, an arm and is sending them pieces every week. Oh. So now we've got you know in in boxes because they're eccentric. Uh, so you can you can really go off the rails in the direction the players want. And for for research. Um, filing down history is helpful. Looking into cultural history and finding like, oh, wow, you know, weaving and, and the process of creating clothes were actually a very big deal <laughs> for, for a large portion of history. Most people did that by themselves. Um, or uh, I, I really love animal biology and, and going through and, and learning more about animals. And I, I'll create a lot of my, my creepiest monsters, which is like, okay, what can spiders do? Oh, there's this weird breed <laughs> of spider that does this. Or you know, uh, lice do these things. Wow, that would be scary if it was larger. <laughs> so uh, interpreting uh, <laughs> biology and history and all the things we, we sort of slept through in school, taking a couple of notes and looking at those notes and saying, well, maybe, or I occasionally find notes that I wrote when I was like six or eight years old on like a character sheet. It's like, okay, these elves, they, they live in the desert. They, they can't get sand in their eyes. I'm like, well, what if they had an extra, you know, uh, an extra what's the phrase uh, there's a, a layer over the eye that camels have yeah, it's, a, them. it's like a nictating membrane in their eye or something nictating them i only yeah, know this from yeah, the star trek episode but. <laughs> so, but it was so that's now a thing in in our world elves from the desert have nictating membranes and they they can't get sand in their eyes as it were so really collaborating even with even your younger self whatever you can um to, to make the best story well you Lou, talked too about for you? yeah Yes, it does. I was going to say, Travis talked about going around the world and, and actually looking at, at, at real world ex- examples and pulling that back in in his bio. And I, um, when I, you know, there's a, there's a scene in my first book where they get caught in some rapids. And it's completely from a, a, a very dangerous rafting trip I took in Tennessee one time during a storm. And, uh, but I, I, um, I, I, I believe in mapping before I'm writing and, uh, and letting the map collaborate with me. And I, I um, you know, I, I got, I was fortunate. I worked with Rob Lazaretti, who's done a lot of maps for Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder both. But I, you know, if you can't work with Rob, then then there's a website called Incarnate, which has a lot of free map resources at a very, very cheap twenty-five dollar commercial pro level, and you can make gorgeous maps on that. But however you do it, pen and paper, digital tools, um, I would make the map, and then sometimes the map will dictate. So uh, to go back to the to the Constantinople-like city in my second novel, uh, there's a there's I had a 
when the walls come down, I had planned for one of the villainous characters to be responsible. And then when I was looking at the map, I realized that where they were in a Colosseum was, you know, maybe a three hour walk to get to the wall. And there was no way they could drop the wall. It just couldn't happen. And I had to change the story and have the wall come down a different way. And stuff like that happens. And also, uh, I, you know, as I jokingly say, artists are, are thinking often with a different part of the brain. Sometimes, no matter how many times I would say, this need, you know, the staircase is on the first level of the plateau. It would be on the second level. I'd say, no, it's on the first level of the plateau. And it wouldn't be on the plateau. And I'd say, no, it's on the first level of the plateau. And it would be on the third level of the plateau. And so finally, I'm like, you know what? Yes, it's not where I think it is. The staircase is wherever he put it, and that, and then the story changes around that, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's a lot of fun. But I, I, one of the fun things that happened was I, when I, when the first book came out, I, I got to take a trip to Norway, and I um, was in Norway taking photographs, and then emailing them to Lazaretti while he was doing the maps, so I was able to actually show him the landscape, and I got this was this was when we were in edits on the first novel, and I got. And it's going to lead into a tip. I got back from Norway and I was worried that because the landscape is, is so unique and pictures don't do it justice. And I was worried that I was going to have to go through my book and just do a description pass and change everything because I, there was no way I could have captured that before I'd gone. And I, reading through it, I found out that I had captured it almost exactly with the exception of there are little red berries all over the hills in the summertime and I didn't have the red berries. And thinking about why that was, I realized that um, it's because before I went to Norway, I had played 100 hours of Skyrim. And <laughs> they had gone to Norway, and they had photographed everything, and I had internalized it, and then it had come out. So when I wrote the second novel, I played Assassin's Creed, the, the one that takes place in Istanbul. And um, there's a writer named John Oxier, who's a, a children's book writer, and he wrote a book called Sweep that takes place in in England um, on, the chimney, in the, on the chimney tops in the, in the Victorian era. And he could not find any refer photo references for that because they had been bombed in the Blitz. There weren't a lot of surviving photo references of what the rooftops of London looked like. So on my advice, mm -hmm. he played the Assassin's Creed game in London. And that's how he internalized the, the setting. So I'm a, I'm a really big believer in combining extensive historical research with hours and hours of video gaming. <laughs> Well, and it's a and great letting, tip. And but it's also too. like it's it's simultaneously a cautionary tale. Because it's a great example of the fact that like it really matters how you've chosen your sources because you were able to totally reproduce what you saw in Skyrim. And if Skyrim had not been beautifully researched and imagined, you might just be reproducing like an irresponsible pattern that you picked up the way we all do. Uh, I I think that's a tremendous argument for like filling your head with as much cool, interesting, deeply researched stuff as you can, because you, you absolutely will absorb it as if by osmosis, the way yes. human brains you know, are. I, I sat through um, like a 30 hour lecture from some guy on the history of Norway. And my, I, I watched it at lunch every day for a month. My wife came in and she's, I'll watch it with you. And she sits down and two seconds into it, she goes, nope, this is boring. <laughs> she's gone. But you know, I sat through the whole 30 hours and it it wasn't, on one hand, it was fascinating. On the other hand, it really was dry and boring. It was just a guy standing at a podium lecturing with no backdrop, nothing. But, you know, it was that, and it was 100 hours of video gaming. And the two <laughs> together were equally important. Now, I believe you each sent us some great examples. Uh, Lou, I believe you sent us a couple of map examples. I'd love to take a look at uh, one of those, Will, if we have them handy. Um, just as, as a... Go ahead, go ahead. Which one would you like to see? Let's throw up Windholm. Yeah, that's Sindholm, but that's good too. That's actually the one with the staircase that moves. <laughs> Very There's nice. Windholm. So Windholm. I love this Tell one. us a little about Windholm. When I, well, when I went to do, in the book, we only get to see one town. And when I went to do the game, we, we made nine more towns. And so stuff that was just a sentence or two in my notes, in my copious notes, had to actually expand. And so this is a, a town that sits across a waterfall. It's, it's all, the, all, the, 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 all the Viking settlements in history were built either right on the water's edge or up the plateaus. You know, when, we were, when I was in Norway, you would see these plateaus and there'd be houses on the plateau. And I saw no roads. And I asked somebody, how did they get to their house? And the guy said, there's 
600 steps down to a boat dock and they take it up and down. And so this town has gone up the sides of the hill, but the thing that crosses it there, that crosses it is a, is a petrified giant longship from a now long vanished frost giant civilization. And at some point in the past, it got wedged perpendicular across the waterfall and, and is now hard as rock. And the Jarl has built his longhouse on it. And it serves as a main street for people to get from, from the south side to the north side of the town. And then in the hull of the longship are shops. So there's like an underground Montreal shopping center in this longship, which is also the main thoroughfare back and forth across the town. And then uh, you can't, I don't know if you can see it, but below the longship, there's a tongue of rock that sticks out from the waterfall. And they lower you on buckets to fight home ganga, which are the, the, the trial by combat. If you're not satisfied with the, with, the, with the way the law speaker has ruled, you can challenge somebody to the death. So they put you in a bucket, they lower you from the longship onto the rock, and then you fight before the waterfall. And there's no coming back from that. So you win or you lose. Or I guess you dive off the rock. So that's one of my favorite places. Oh, that's incredible. And I believe, right. Travis, you sent us a bunch of resources that were simultaneously, you said map and symbology. What is the connection there? And how do you approach map making? Sure. Uh, for map, mage, make, yeah, map making, uh, my develop maps thing, if you pull up the rough, um, basically I, I draw, uh, well, before that, there's like the sort of terrible um, MS paint of a city, and that's that's actually a good spot. So we'll start here. I had an idea for a city that would have hexagonal buildings, and then we realized before that we would need space for these weird highways that you just saw sort of drawn, was the idea of like developing the city before it gets ruined for over 700 years of neglect. Um, but it would need extra space for each kind of like hex block to fit uh, because they would otherwise like hit each other. They would have clipping issues. It would be like a, um, the Bethesda office where you have the tree that goes through the walls. Um, so adding a little bit of space really helped. And uh, in the next one uh, picture over, we should see some uh, more stuff. That's the highways that we're trying to, to build in and, and sort of weave uh, automated cars. So we don't need to worry about that. We don't need to worry about um, left-hand turns sort of trying to make things very sleek. And with the final uh, picture in there, we started developing the different types of buildings that we would place in the different hex spots. And then uh, one or two more beyond that is the finished product, which is this massive uh, city. So sort of starting small. That's the original drawing right there. We, we've hidden it. Ah! Zero. Um, that's the final uh, with the hexagon in the middle, what you just saw, and then expanding it outward. And every building isn't entirely unique, but it was all manually placed. And we've hidden a lot of details in the mix so that we can say this event happens here. Here's like one little block area where you've got uh, Bridget's headquarters and uh, there's the tower that she goes on a date in one of our stories in the comic, Bridget goes on a date. Um, and sort of the views that she can see, which made it easier for the artist because drawing hexagonal buildings is very tough. <laughs> you know, not knowing uh, anything about that story, looking at it, just the hexagons and the the very, mathematical layout of it makes me think bees and regimented society and and a kind of technological oppression and all these things start coming out just from the image so you're, I don't know if you're I'm exactly right on not yep. totally on point and uh also inspired incidentally by madrid which has these hexagonal buildings in, in rows uh, instead of uh, the full hex grid but it's the same style of building, uh, roughly the same height, six or six or eight stories, and it's just very like, wow, that's that's pretty amazing. Um, what if we expanded this in like a space <laughs> setting? So. Now, and how does that connect with uh, symbology? That you sent some interesting sort of oh, example uh, symbology stuff. So I, I was thinking in, in in sort of different ways visually, you can you can have some very fun things. So you can establish like a little flag or like what your worlds look like. You have your hello, you have your goodbye, you have your deities. Having a symbol, even if it's poorly drawn, these ones were lovingly rendered by my friend James. Um, it can influence a lot of your culture. And you can also refer to these symbols. You can sneak them into other places if it's represented visually. It's really easy to sneak things through. Um, if you uh, click the next one over uh, for Borjoka, we have sort of this flesh weaving god and, and their, their symbol is on the top right hand corner. Uh, they're basically like they're cutting the the, uh, the strings of fate, your life, as it were. And people who follow this god wrap themselves in string. So on like a next picture over, you'll have a necromancer who's wrapped themselves in a string. And you won't think of them as being a, uh, a follower of a god of death because necromancy is undeath. But sure enough, they are. And you can 
uh, glean parts of discussions with a perception check. Now, when you're talking to this person, you see that they do have this cord wrapped around them. And actually, you know, they, they've put stitching into every one of their creations lovingly. And maybe they're not as evil as we thought they were, despite them having kind of a sort of creepy smile, maybe. But <laughs> uh, you can you can glean a lot of facts just by by going about it with those sorts of things. Or the other example we have uh, very quickly, if you just sort of flip through it very fast, is this god of fear. Uh, drawn one way, symbols in the top right-hand corner. That's them on a, on a triptych, which is like a comic book page that we made very artistic. Um, this god of fear, Hegaros, uh, which is sort of the letters for adrenaline um, spelled out. And then the next one over, we have mm -hmm. two different representations of their symbols, one in just sort of tattoo form on this creepy uh, ganger guy who, who loves darkness and fear, because this is the god of fear, and he has the tattoo of the god of fear because he wants to scare other people. And then in the next slide over, it's a uh, or picture of rather, it's the last one. It's a different person who uh, wants to defeat fear. And he has it sort of weaved into other peaceful motifs. And he's also a, a necromancer who, who doesn't want people to be afraid. So uh, incorporating symbology into your world, be it flags, be it on posters, be it the signs of your, your inns, or you know many different ways you can interpret even the same symbol. Um, they can take on a, a different meaning and, and really add a lot of depth. This has been so fantastic. I think we have time just an uh, extremely quick couple of questions uh, from chat. Thank you so much. Um, someone, Olivia Mulligan, asked per one of our earlier discussions about using accents. Um, and I'd love, Travis, to hear some, some advice on this one. A lot of accents could be used to further negative stereotypes. Um, so sort of associating different classes or origins with, with accents. Is it something you're familiar with? And how do you make sure to stay on the right side of it? So the answer for me to staying on the right side with accents and stereotypes, uh, you don't try to peg an accent for a specific type of person. You peg it for maybe a region or a city or a town as opposed to, and you don't say anyone from that, everyone from this place is bad because we don't, we don't mm -hmm. deal in extremes. I'm a very gray storyteller. Um, there are people who don't believe in that philosophy. My philosophy is gray because I, I don't think anyone should be bad or good. They have their own perception of what they are. Uh, to avoid being hurtful in those ways, um, if you're on a on a bigger uh, project, I, I work with genuine voices. So all the people who are who speak with accents actually have the accent they're supposed to have the accent from, and I cast accordingly. My voice is actually not featured in the show as a character because I'm very self conscious of my voice. Uh, around my own table, I, I will use accents, and I'll try and like fill in. And actually, in game, I'll I'll fill in um, with the intent again of of not stereotyping. Uh, a type of accent as being bad or good, and elves are represented by a Portuguese accent or a Swedish accent, or because humans don't all speak the same language, why would other species do the same? So having multiple accents for uh, representation can be also uh, helpful, and, and try not to stereotype. Uh, it, it, and spending time on your accents is is also helpful. Great advice. Uh, I'm curious. Let's see. I, again, very, very quick. Monica13 says, do you work backwards when you create the world or do you have a basic idea and then flesh it out with character interaction? Uh, is this, is there a simple answer to that or does it depend on the story and the approach? Lou? Uh, it depends on the story and the approach. You know, I, with, yeah. for, the, for, the, for the novel, I started with character and work forward. Um, with other things, I worked backwards. I have a novel called Once Upon a Unicorn about a unicorn and a nightmare learning to get along. And that worked backwards from their getting along, you know. And it's a platonic Romeo and Juliet with horses. You know how it's <laughs> going to go. And you got to roll that backwards. Um, I love what Travis said about there are no bad cultures. There's no bad um, places. I just really quickly uploaded uh, a piece of art called Svartalfar. I don't know if it's shown up yet, but can we show it if it has? I just put it in the email thread. Um, I have dark elves in my setting that are, are uh, based on the, on the Norse dark elves, which were pale white skin with dark hair and lived underground. And when I built their culture, they are, they are, they're not the Machiavellian drow. They are, they're fascistic. They're, they're, they, you see the flags. They're very, very deliberately evocative. They're the, the, they're the worst aspects of the Nazi appropriation of Norse culture. And, um, but if you look at the drawing where they're about to execute that poor human, on the far right side, you see a mother turning her child's face away. Because mm -hmm. inside the mm -hmm. confines of this is a lawful evil, this is a lawful evil society. But within the confines of that, there are people who are struggling under it. And, you know, there, there are going to be people who are opposed to it, people who are un unable to rise against it so far, 
This is another one of those landmines I'm talking about. There may be a ton of them ready to rebel, but they don't yet have the courage or the guts or the right impetus. There are also people who are profiting from it, who don't really care what the alignment is, but they're currently benefiting from the system, who may flip so if the they're no longer to, to not treat it like a monolith when you're creating right. those right. cultures it can, well, can help to sort of... Government has an alignment. The people in the government don't. Mm. Yes. I would love to keep you both for so much longer, but thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your experiences in your different forms of storytelling and the shared forms. Where can folks find more of your work, Lou? Well, I'm on lewanders.com. I'm on Facebook. There's a Thrones and Bones Facebook page. And if I can plug it, uh, the Kickstarter right now is in pre-order on Indiegogo In Demand. It's, uh, it's Thrones and Bones, Cohen Norengard. N O R R O N G A R D, and we are we are taking pre-orders right now. We're going to deliver at the end of the year, and I'm on Twitter at Lou Anders. Excellent, and Travis. I'm uh, Twitter at Ven V E N Travis T R A V I S, uh, or you can uh, find Dark Dice however you listen to podcasts, or FoolandScholar.com to find all of our shows. All right. Thank you both so much. This has been incredibly enlightening. I can't wait to dive deeper into your respective worlds. And please keep making this wonderful art. And uh, I, I, I got to know more about the sword stories. I'm so fascinated now. Uh, congratulations on the campaign. Congratulations. I think just you hit six years of Fool and Scholar. Is that recent? Six years and a webby. <laughs> <laughs> thank you both for joining me today. And we'll see you next time on D&D Beyond. It's D&D